So, um, you've been to lots of talks today, workshop talks, keynote addresses, and things like that. Uh, obviously, this is process palooza, so we concentrate on very wide things associated with process, business process mapping, how to make the process more efficient, how to identify business processes, how to deal with change uh, uh, in terms in, in, in the context of business process uh, kind of disruption. Um, I'm going to talk about processes, but I'm going to talk about it from a little bit different direction. Uh, I'm on the IT side, and one of the things that we care about on the IT side is making sure that people have the data that they need to make decisions. Um, and so what we care about is making sure there aren't disruptions to that. And one of the key things that we're interested in from a process perspective is what drive, what processes that you have uh, drive your desire for data. So that's, that's it. Uh, it would be uh, remiss of me to not mention ESR. Uh, who here has not heard of ESR? Good, okay. So this is just a brief thing. Um, as you know, the scope is ginormous. Uh, it involves every core campus system, students, uh, uh, HR payroll, financial, research, identity and access management, um, uh, facilities, and then lots of little ancillary systems around that. Uh, so for example, uh, we are doing a next generation version of our email infrastructure on campus. That is not Officially ESR, but since it plays into lots of the existing systems, it's effectively going to be part of itself, ESR as well. Ultimately, at the end of the day, everything is ESR, it seems like. So there are two ways to look at this. At the surface, and I don't mean when I say at the surface, I don't mean superficially because it's important. At the surface, you say every application that you use today, every major application you use today, core application, is going to change. If you use IPIS, bye bye. If you use ISIS, so long. Uh, if you use uh, FinLink, QueryLink, have access to the data warehouse, all of those things are going to go away. Um, and again, this is not a superficial analysis, but it's the thing that people will notice first. It's like, what happened to my 3270 terminal, my green screen? I, do, I can't get to my green screen anymore. I can't do anything. That goes away too, because there's no more mainframe, right? And so that, at the surface, that's the change. The deeper meaning, though, is what we're talking about, and this sounds kind of fluffy, is that we're reshaping the way UC San Diego does business, which is, if you think about it, the whole gist of what Process Palooza is about, it's the gist of what Lean Bench is about, about Lean Six Sigma, all this process analysis is essentially about it. about looking at what happens in our workflow to get to figure out if this is a bottleneck, figure out that this could be streamlined in this way, that we could make our business processes more efficient. That's the essence of this. This is a huge change for us. ESR is a huge change for us. Uh, graphically, you can imagine that it's moving from horse and buggy to supersonic transport. Uh, and that's probably an understatement of the magnitude of the change that's gonna be happening on this campus. This is a big deal because some of our old systems, our legacy systems, have been around for 25, in some cases, 30 years, right? Uh, some of them, many of them have been there longer than some of us have been here, right? They, they predate us on this campus. Now, when I talk about legacy systems, we, we often throw this term around and say, what is a legacy system? Well, so I have a, two definitions of legacy. One's a sort of good definition, if it's a noun. Well, it's kind of good. If somebody has to die, you get money in your will, but it's kind of a good thing because you get stuff, right? So noun is good. Adjective, which is kind of in the context of IT, and of course, everything associated with IT has a bad connotation. So in an adjectival form, it means something related to software, services, hardware, systems that has been superseded. There's something newer, better, uh, more efficient, whatever, but we can't replace it or it's extraordinarily difficult for us to replace it because it's, it's in widespread use. Everybody depends on this. And if we simply remove it, everything breaks. Uh, and the cost of change. And cost of change can be measured in a number of different dimensions. We can say simply, okay, it's gonna cost us a zillion dollars to buy a new enterprise system we don't have the budget for a zillion dollars, so we're not going to do this thing. It's also, more importantly, the cost of kind of human change associated with this. And uh, you probably have already been to some of the workshop talks which talk about this. Uh, right now, in parallel with this, Bernadette Hahn is talking about organizational change management. That's the same kind of idea. It's actually the human beings in the equation that are the hard part to deal with change. I'm not putting it down or anything. But, um, 
changing our system is 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 actually in some sense trivial, especially if you have no users. I can change other systems tomorrow, and if I have no users, it doesn't have any impact at all. It doesn't matter. The system doesn't care. It's like, oh look, I'm running a new system. <laughs> all the people say, oh my God, you're running a new system. Ah. So those are the ones that are causing the problems uh, in terms of change management, and those are the things that we have to deal with in, in, in this context. There's also another sense of legacy, which is the baggage that you bring along when you have a legacy system. The in-house systems that we have were once considered state-of-the-art, that they were cutting edge. And this is, I'm not, I'm not lying, this is actually true. Back when ISIS was invented a million years ago, back when IFAS was invented a million minus five years ago, um, they were actually cutting edge. Among the UC campuses and other universities, we were ahead of the game. In terms of business process automation, people looked at us and said, wow, this is cool stuff. We're, we're passing things around on index cards still, and you actually had built a computer system to do that. Unfortunately, the way things work, uh, anybody here have an old PC that doesn't really work very well anymore because it's so incredibly slow and you can't, you can't put a new version of Windows on it and it's infected with viruses and all this other one stuff, and so you basically push it in the garage because I don't know what to do with this thing. Or you put it on Craigslist and, and say it's somebody else's problem now. That's the way that's the way our legacy systems are as well, right? You can only do so much to enhance them. Early on, you can make them work well, you can you can probably add new features and stuff like that, but over time, you they get old, they get kind of calcified, and you can't add new stuff. More importantly, they don't keep pace with what the customers need. And there's this whole ecosystem of things that we do in our various jobs that we need to respond to both internal and external forces. Uh, we need to accredit ourselves, uh, accredit our programs in different ways than we have historically done. The accrediting agencies come along and say, we need this new information. Or we need this new data analysis that you can't do on your old mainframe system. So customer paid, customer, and I'll show you a graph, Customer needs kind of go in one direction and the legacy system sort of stays static over time. Um, what this means is, don't forget to read this, um, what this means is that IT professionals and the customers have to fill in the gap ultimately between what legacy systems can do and what's actually needed. And this is not a mathematically correct graph. Any, any mathematicians in the audience do not quote me on this. In particular, note that I have no y-axis, so, so by definition, this is a bad graph. But it's, it's still illustrative. And the reason why it is this. So this is time down here. I, I apologize for the size of this screen. This is the smallest screen I've ever seen. Uh, this is a feature of the price center, apparently, is that all screens are about this big. So I, trust me, these are numbers down here. Um, and this is essentially the, the age of a legacy system. I've arbitrarily chosen 30 years, which is approximate the age of some of our legacy system. Um, Early on, uh, and so and so, this is this is how the, the the legacy system kind of meets your meets your needs, meets the capabilities, or its capabilities meet the user needs. And so early on, I say, wow, actually, it meets them pretty well. You hope it would, right? You wouldn't want to build a system and say on day one, oh, doesn't look like it meets anybody's needs. Oh well. So let's let's say hypothetically, in the best case scenario, you actually meet people's needs early on, and then you'll notice for a while you actually can kind of track those needs. Because the system is still new, people understand how it works, it's not overly complex, I haven't added a lot of features that makes it difficult to change, and so on. So change management on the system is actually easier. So I can kind of track what users need. Then, you know, obsolescence kind of, kind of rears its ugly head, and you'll see that eventually we kind of start to see a gap between, between what we can do and what people need. And this is what people need. I've arbit arbitrarily chosen exponential curve because that's kind of the way technology changes. Early on, you say, okay, there's a gap. And what do we do in this? Early on in that kind of gap, what do we do? We basically say, okay, the system doesn't do what I really need it to do, but oh well, suck it up. It's, it's just gonna, it, it is what it is. I can't get the report that I want, not, not a big deal. But, but over time, this gap becomes extraordinarily large. And like I said, when, you, when, a, when a funding agency says, please provide this report, and tell us, you know, tell us how you're paying your graduate students. And this legacy system says, I can't do that. I don't even, I don't even know what that means. I didn't even have those kinds of students when I was built. I don't know how, I don't know how to answer that question. And so what we do is we start filling this gap with stuff to, to make up for the difference between what the old system can do and what our needs actually are. And what are these things? Well, they're helper applications that can sort of bolt onto the mainframe, not literally, well, maybe sometimes literally, bolt onto the mainframe to kind of act as an intermediary for what it can do and what we need. We build screen scrapers. How many of you here have heard of screen scrapers? 
Yes, <laughs> great. Uh, all of you have been here for a long time, and so you know what screen scrapers are. It's essentially so you don't have to look at the old green screen. It sort of picks what's, picks what's off of the green screen and puts it into a web format. Um, we build shadow systems where they kind of operate over here on the side. We write hand coded reports because the, the database doesn't do exactly what we want. We have secret databases on the side, uh, which is where we say, okay, the data warehouse, I cannot get my answers out of the data warehouse. So I'm just going to download all of the raw data from the data warehouse. I'm going to put it in my own little tables. I'm going to do joins on these tables, and I'm going to generate reports because the data warehouse doesn't do that. So I have all these little secret databases. I have external spreadsheets that I use for pivot tables and graphing and all the rest of this stuff. I have post it notes. I have Hacks, I have incantations, I do sacrifices at midnight, whatever it is, <laughs> to get information out of this system. So I filled this gap. Why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem for two reasons, at least. Um, if everybody's on the same system, you know, we, we talk about the goals of, of process analysis. One of the goals of process analysis is that we at least have some level of consistency. So if I'm in the econ department, and I'm in the electrical and computer engineering department, and I'm in the theater department, my business processes hopefully look the same. So that if someone says, please generate a report, what you uh, generate your profit loss statement for your department, the numbers that the that Pierre is going to get, the CFO is going to get, or the number that the EBC is going to get, they're kind of they're kind of comparable, right? If everybody is using sort of a slightly different business process, they say, well, we did pretty well this year. And then somebody else looks at those same numbers and says, no, you're about two hundred thousand dollars in the hole. And so we have this sort of divergence of business processes and applications associated with these business processes. And if then the goal of everybody sort of kind of having the same business process goes away, the consistency is lost. The other disadvantage of this is that when something dramatic or traumatic like ESR comes along, what we're doing is we're saying, oh, you know, we're, we're going to move this curve like this. And now all these things that you've been using for the past decade or two or three you to say, well, what happened to my application? It doesn't work anymore. That is that is my business process, is that application. It's like, too bad, you're now, now your business process is here in blue, and you move the blue up to here. And so all of these applications that people have built that they've relied on for the business process has now officially gone away. And how do you handle that level of change? And so that's, you know, when we talk about uh, the, the human side of managing change, that's the difficulty here is kind of letting go of these things and moving forward. Um, what is what does this kind of radical change look like to IT people? Um, it means we don't build custom systems anymore. Uh, ISIS and IFIS we built here, more or less. Uh, lots of other legacy systems we built here. We don't do that anymore. Somebody else now has a system. The reason why we did that, by the way, is because at the time there was no such thing as an IFIS for a university system that met our needs. You couldn't go out and buy one from somebody because that somebody didn't exist and that product didn't exist. So we built them ourselves. That those times have gone away. In fact, they went away a while ago, um, which means we don't build custom systems anymore. And we use hosted solutions, software as a service. Our new financial system is not going to be IFAS, it's going to be Oracle Financials, which obviously Oracle runs. Um, it's not ours anymore. We also don't do custom coding anymore. Our changes to the systems are done by configuration, not building custom code. So, to give you an example, we, we ultimately will have a new uh, student information system. And if a student information system vendor came to us and said, we only support the semester system. So too bad for you, UCSD, you're going to have to change to the semester system. Forget about the quarter system. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to meet our needs. Nobody does that. But, so we have the option of going in and saying, OK, we're in the quarter system, we're in the trimester system, we're in the semester system, we're on whatever. It's a configuration option for us. And they support those kinds of things out of the box. We don't have to write any special code to support the quarter system. It just happens by set, essentially, I'm, I'm glossing over this, essentially flipping a switch that says we're on the quarter system. And it, and it knows what to do. That's easier for us, but it means we're not writing code anymore. Similarly, database queries and scripts and things like that, we're actually talking to the raw database and saying, what's the name of that column in that database so I can extract this data? Those things tend to go away and they're replaced by APIs, application programming interfaces, which is how programs talk to one another. Uh, business intelligence tools, dashboards that essentially allow you to say, graph this thing, now do this other thing. And think of it as, think of it as sort of like pivot tables on steroids, right? Um, and so this is a good thing, but it again moves us away from this low level stuff. Similarly, in terms of systems and hardware, we're not going to be managing these things locally anymore. Uh, they're all sitting out in the cloud, whatever that is. 
Um, and they're all uh, kind of living out there in this amorphous state, not here on campus, same as true with the data centers and the data systems, but uh, they're also off-site. What does this mean? From, from the perspective of us as IT people, uh, how many of you have heard of the term full stack? Full stack basically means hardware all the way up to the very top of the stack, web, web services or whatever, right? So in the olden days, uh, you would say, okay, first I need to make sure there's power to the outlet to plug my computer into, then I need to make sure that the hardware works, and then I need to make sure that the operating work system on top of the hardware works, then I need to make sure that the application development environment works, then I have to make sure that the web servers work, blah, 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 blah. So I'm concerned with everything all the way from the ground up to the very top of the stack. What I'm doing now is I'm essentially, in this new model, I am moving this line up, which is the line of things that I care about, or the, the line below which I do not care. So hardware, eh, not my phone, not there. Operating system, somebody else's business, right? Even the application development environment, that's what, which is what platform as a service is, uh, is essentially not my problem anymore. This is, this is a big change for us in IT because uh, a lot of people do these jobs. And they, then they have to say, what is, what is my job now? Because if you don't need a person who takes care of the hardware and pushes buttons on the hardware, what do I do? There's a similar issue that goes on when you, uh, from, the, from the end user, from the customer's perspective, um, what does radical change look like for you all? Um, this thing that sort of arbitrarily looks like a garbage bag um, has all of the things that we know and love or know and loathe. Uh, facilities, not uh, facilities information system, uh, some of these things are central systems, ISIS, IFIS, query link, thin link, data, uh, data warehouse. Some of these are other things that are built locally, local applications, your access database, your secret databases, all those kinds of things. All of this is going out the door. These don't exist anymore, right? This is a cause for consternation. It's very similar to the cause for consternation that people on the IT side have. It's like, what do I do now? I have defined myself by these tools that I use, or at least partially defined myself by these tools that I use. They've all gone away. What do I do now? Well, um, the problem here is, uh, and, and this is this is something that anybody who's done the process analysis kind of stuff should, should know about, is that we want to move away from sort of application affinity, which is where, and what I mean by that is which is where we have co-joined or con kind of concatenated together our business processes, our need for data, and our applications into a single blob, right? And so everything looks like that blob. Applications are just a mean to an end. A means to an end. It's how you get your stuff done. The applications are not business processes. Applications implement business processes or applications enable business processes, but applications by themselves are not business processes, right? So the perception of change is this. If you have high application affinity, if you've glopped all these things together and you imagine that your business process or your reason for being or whatever is tied up in this application, and this is the human change kind of thing, you look at this and you say, well, here's a click here button that is blue and sort of squarish or rectangular. And here's this, oh my gosh, someone changed out my button on me. There's this, there's this green button. It's sort of like oval or something, and it looks different. I, I, is this going to work? I don't know. Is this going to work? It's because you say, you've identified, well, this is, this is like a totally different thing. What if this is really approval PO? If your business process includes something like approve PO, and you click here and it approves a PO, and you click here and it approves a PO, you're good, right? But a lot of people have a hard time getting past that because, and you, you think that this is superficial, but I can guarantee you that it's not superficial because I've seen people complain about uh, the button seems to have moved to the other side of the screen. You, you, did something change? Is, is this different? And we say, user in the case change. It's, it's not a big deal. It still says approve PO. It's like, damn, it's on the other side of the screen. What do I do now? I was like, Trust me, it's, there's nothing wrong with the application. It has not changed your underlying business process. It's really just the button is moved, right? But that's a difficult kind of change when you kind of glop together these things, to glop together these things. Okay, so, um, so instead of focusing on the what, what you use to do things, you focus on the why of doing things. And again, I apologize for this, this eye chart thing. Uh, and I will tell you that it actually gets worse later on. So, um, we focus on the why. For most customers, outside of maybe application developers, applications exist to get work done, but they aren't the work itself, or at least it shouldn't be the work itself, 
right? So if I'm a student affairs person, and my job is to make sure that my undergraduates graduate on time, that they, that they keep their GPAs up, that they fulfilled all the prerequisites so that they can get out of the, out of the door in normative time, um, that's my job. I can use a tool like ISIS or, or, um, or QueryLink or any of these other tools uh, to help me get that done, to help me get students out the door. But if you go up to a student, uh, uh, a student advisor kind of person and say, what's your job? Hopefully, she will say, my job is to get my undergraduates out the door and get them jobs or whatever. Hopefully, they will not say, my job is to use ISIS, right? And so, so the, work, the, job, the applications exist to get stuff done. They aren't there for the work itself. Now, I will say, if the application is so dreadful and so hard to use that it does become work, well, then that's why we invent things like ESR. Because while ESR is about business process improvement fundamentally, uh, you can only go so, so far when your applications suck <laughs> allowing you to do that, right? And so, so hopefully the, the applications aren't so burdensome, don't induce, introduce so much overhead that you can't get your stuff done. So there is a temptation when you have this application affinity to sort of go in the opposite direction. You define your business process in terms of the applications that you use. You say, okay, in this screen on 3270, I click PF3 and it moves me to this other screen and that's my workflow. That's not your workflow, that's how you use the application. Those are different things. The real way to look at this is the other way, which again, process Palooza, is business processes drive everything, right? Business processes have to have data in order to make informed decisions. And uh, trust me on this, these, these little decision boxes are so microscopic that you probably can't see them, but these are decision boxes. What do you need to make a decision? You have to have data, right? So again, going back to the student affairs example, if a student comes to me and says, I want to graduate by the end of the fall quarter. Is that possible? And I have to look at a variety of things like what's your GPA, what have you taken all the prerequisites, stuff like that. If I have none of that information, I might as well just use a random number generator and say, yeah, sure, you can graduate, or maybe you can. I don't know, because I have no data to actually make a decision on, right? So all of these little boxes in your business process require some decision so you can make an informed choice about what you want to what you want to do, how you want to move through this thing. Otherwise, you're stuck. You can't you can't do anything. So it demands data in, in, in order to make those kinds of decisions. But getting data is, is what applications are for. So Data, drive, data needs drive application development in order to get high quality information back into this business process. But it's important to note that the arrows go this way. Applications do not define your business processes or they shouldn't define your business processes. Bad applications define your business processes. If you say, oh, this is what Excel lets me do, I guess that's my business process. And, it, and then somebody, somebody from Lean, uh, the Lean Bench comes in and says, oh, that's the worst business process I've ever seen. And they say, well, I was just kind of conforming to what Excel would let me do, right? That's, they won't like you if you say that, right? So, so this is the way this is the way this, this stuff is actually going to work. What's the reality here? Just kind of stepping back, what's the reality? One, the core enterprise systems are going away. Too bad. Um, two, the legacy mechanisms, mechanisms for accessing using data also go away. So if you use query link, too bad. If you directly access the data warehouse, too bad. If you go with the FinLink and say, please give me a report, too bad. All of these things go away. Sadly, your business processes stick around, right? And in the absence of data, and these are existing business processes, or hopefully new improved ones, um, your business processes are kind of stuck there, right? If you don't have data, you can have the best business process in the world. You can you, you, you have done the complete analysis, and you think, you think this is totally streamlined, and then the first decision box you get to, you say, oh, can't do anything else because I have no data to actually make a decision on. So, that's a problem. I, I get to the input stage where I'm looking for data to make a decision, and there is no input. So defining kind of how you consume data from these core systems uh, and how your business processes and way of doing business is going to change as a result of this stuff is, is critical here. So decisions still require institutional data. So what's the data consumer to do, and what, is, what are we as data providers to do? And so what we're doing is we're trying to ask the right, right questions in this context. Um, I'll give you a hint. The one with the check mark is the right one. Um, the rest one, I, I, it would be too pejorative you to put a big red X next to it, but these are not good. So um, if you ask what applications do you use, that is not super informative to me. If I say, if I'm trying to 
figure out your business process, and I ask you, what applications do you use? And you say, IFIS. And I say, okay, IFIS is going away. What have you told me about your business process? Nothing. Nothing. You tell me you use IFIS, and I can tell you it's going away, but I don't know how to help you other than to say, too bad that it's gone. Similarly, it's slightly better, but similarly, you can say, I can ask you, how do you get your data? And I can say, well, I go into Aqua Data Studio, and I write a SQL query, and I push it against the data warehouse, and I get stuff. And I say, well, no, the data warehouse is going to go away. So same problem here. I, you've not given me any information about your business process. A little bit better is I can say, what data do you need? But if someone comes to me and says, OK, on a quarterly basis, I need to have uh, the complete course grade information for all of the majors in my department. And that's all they tell me. I say, OK, I might be able to provide that in, your, in the enterprise system, but I have no idea why you're using that data or what, that's me what, what is that meaningful to you. Is it just because you were looking at it and say, oh, they're doing pretty well, or is it because you need to report to the accreditation agency that our majors have a certain GPA? Or there are some, of the, some of them are in intercollegiate athletics, and you want to say, these ones, get, these ones continue to be eligible. Whatever it is, there's something that drives your need, what drives your need for the data. So that's why number four is the right answer is why do you need the data? Because that is the business process question. That's what we need to kind of drill in on. So from our perspective, since we're shutting down all the systems that provide people the data that they need to do make their decisions on a daily basis, um, what is our process for doing this? Uh, we want to produce an inventory of downstream data consumers, and we em want to emphasize at the outset descriptions of the business processes that drive the need. Um, and this is actually a little bit backwards from what we originally wanted to do, uh, or what was originally being done, which was, oh, just give us an inventory of your applications. And then we discovered, uh, unsurprisingly, oh, that doesn't actually really tell us much at all. <laughs> it says you have an application, and I can guarantee you it's not going to work when the SR is done, and that's that's. Boom, I stopped. That's, I can't go any farther than that. So we kind of flipped this around in its head and said, please tell us about the business processes that drive your need in as much detail as you can. The next thing is to we want to collect sufficient information so we can determine the nature of remediation. Remediation in this case means how is the business process that uh, has this data need, the, how is that data need going to be that moving forward, right? And so if I have some decision process in my department, if I have a business process in my department and I need to make a decision based on course grades or uh, prerequisites that students have taken or how much, how much a uh, faculty member has spent on his grant or whatever, um, I need to figure out how to get that data to you. And so the best way for me to figure that out is ask you what the business process is. So not ask me about the data, but ask about the business process. Um, and then finally, for applications, uh, and in many cases, applications kind of support business processes, particularly in the distributed units on the academics of the university, but other, other offices as well. I think CEO level did that too, they have applications that they kind of in-house built. Um, for those applications, uh, we need to figure out whether we call them, throw them away, or keep them. And if we keep them, how long do we keep them? And the reality is, no matter how good ESR is, there are going to be some gaps. It, these systems will not do everything. They're, they're not a panacea. They don't do everything you need. You want the gap to be as small as possible, but there are going to be some gaps. And so for those gaps, we still have to have these applications that we build or that have already been built that we need to kind of refactor so that they work again. Um, but we need to essentially kind of do triage on this giant list of business processes. And this is our business process for figuring out business processes. So, so that's, um, let me see if I can, I have, a, I have an anecdotal question. Oh, I have an anecdotal question. <coughs> so um, I'll give you an example of why this is important. Uh, we were talking to a unit on campus, um, none of you here, I think. We were talking to a unit on campus about the new financial system. And uh, it was me and uh, Kevin Chow, and some names you probably don't know, or maybe you know. Uh, Brent Pollock and uh, Bill McCarroll and folks like that. And we're talking about what world the financials is going to do for you, how the, how the landscape is going to change, what kind of reporting you can do through Tableau and Cognos and things like that. And I thought it went pretty well. It, it looked like this is a much more powerful thing than you had before. And at the end, uh, a person in the audience asked, so this is great. I like all this stuff. It's very fancy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, how do I download the CSV? so that I can import it into my Excel spreadsheet and do a pivot table. 
And Bill McCarroll said, well, Oracle Financial is going to have pivot tables built in. So you don't have to download data. You don't have to figure out how to import it into your cell. You don't have to manipulate it so they still know how to write a pivot table. It's kind of there. But that's the kind of thing that happens when people, and when we talk about the things that call, we're talking about calling business processes, basically, where somebody has created this thing that was completely legitimate in an earlier error because the mainframe couldn't do it, but they're stuck on kind of combining together business process and the information they need and an application they use to get the information. And so we're trying to pry that out and say, what is the, why are you creating that pivot table, right? Don't, don't just tell me, I need a pivot table, I need a pivot table, please give me a pivot table. You may not need a pivot table. There may be actually something even more sophisticated that you could do in Tableau that is going to blow that old pivot table out of the water, right? So that's the kind of challenge here is to get people's heads around that. Um, okay, so what are, what are the kinds of things they were collecting? There are actually two phases of the collection. I'm only gonna talk about the first one. Uh, the first one is so we can essentially do prioritization and make this keep cold kind of decision. Uh, very simple stuff. What's the description? As, 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 as detailed a description as possible of the business process. <coughs> What's the business domain? Student, finance, research, some combination thereof. Uh, the business unit that's responsible for this business process, the vice chancellor, which you can obviously just get from wherever you are. The business owner is the person who understands, hopefully, the business process. It's our best chance of the person who understands the business process. Technical owner is often the person who acts as the interface between whatever backend system you're using to get the data and the business owner. Because some people say, oh, I can write my own SQL. I'm going to just talk directly to the data warehouse. Other people say, I don't even know SQL. Somebody, one of my technical people, one of my IT people is going to write the SQL for me. Right? So there's a technical owner as well. That becomes important later on. User demographic, is it three people in the department? Is the entire department? Is the entire uh, executive vice chancellor's area. Um, we need to kind of understand that to sort of understand the impact of this. A lot of these things are essentially they come up with a pseudo number that says what's the impact of this, of, of the damage that we're doing with ESR. Um, business criticality, business criticality, you will be unsurprised to know that everybody imagines that their applications are the most critical applications in, in the entire campus. We very rarely get people who say, eh, it's okay, it's, it's not super important. Everybody says, our department will grind to a halt if this thing stops working. We have to go in and ask them these kinds of things to verify that that's actually true. Sometimes it is true, sometimes, well, yeah. Um, regulatory compliance requirements, is this for accreditation, or uh, is the, does the government want this for, for a variety of reasons, state, federal, whatever. Uh, data sensitivity, is, are we dealing with HIPAA? Are we dealing with PII? Are we dealing with PERMA data? Uh, are we dealing with things that's under export control? All kinds of stuff like that. Many additional comments. This is the most important part. Now, there are some cases where there's uh, applications associated with these business processes, where they've essentially done business process automation. So where appropriate, we also ask, what's the application type? Is it something you bought from Prize? Is it something you wrote in-house? Is it query link? Is it ISIS? Whatever. What is the <coughs> application? What is the type of the application? How do you access it? So we can start doing kind of forensics on this stuff. What's the name of this thing so we can kind of refer to it and then the aliases that it has. Uh, as detailed as possible, a description of the application. In particular, connect the application <coughs> and the description to the description of the business process. So if I get something, if I get a description of a business process and I get a, oh no, the moderator's leaving, that's how bad it is. Um, <laughs> so if I get a description of a business process and I get a description of an application and I say, I, I can see no connection whatsoever between this application you've been, and what you claim is your business process. I look at that and say, that's a pretty big gap. I need to understand what that is. Um, access control, how do you get at, how do you control it? Is it Active Directory? Is it a local uh, password file? Uh, is it something else? Probable distribution di uh, disposition is what do you think? What do you think is the likely disposition of this particular application? Is it something that we can get rid of? Is it something that we need to keep for a while? Is it something that we probably might need to keep forever? People are actually, unlike the business credit family thing, people are surprisingly honest about the disposition. A lot of people, frankly, say, I do not want to spend programmer time continuing to maintain this application when they should be working on things that are actually more important than this old legacy application to make up for the fact that the mainframe never did what we wanted us to do. So in many cases, they're saying, they're chomping at the bit to say, please, can you provide a central system so I don't have to keep this thing going? So probable disposition, the time frame of the disposition, and then comments. So 
Um, this is the real eye chart. So I'm just going to walk, trust me, um, I'm just going to walk you through this. We have a workflow, a business process, for how we do the remediation activity. This up here is the SMEs who, who kind of know what needs to go in the inventory. Uh, is, is the inventory this, is, this is where we ask the question, is the inventory that we have a business process is complete? Um, and if it's not complete, we add more things. Uh, later on, we say, okay, let's assume that the baseline inventory is correct, but then we look at this description of a business process, and the description says, does stuff for the department. Not super useful to us, and so we need to send some BSA, probably a, uh, a project uh, BSA out there, like a finance project BSA out there, business systems analyst out there to say, okay, could we get a little more out of you than does things for the department? Because I don't know how to remediate does things for the department. I can remediate get my graduate students out on time or check to see if they met all the requirements, I can't get, I can't remediate does things. Um, so this is where we kind of refine that. This is the critical piece here where we look at all of the stuff that we have and we say, we try to make an informed decision about is this something we keep? Is this something we call? Is this something we need more information about? We need to kind of contemplate. And what is the time frame for this kind of stuff? This is where we look at the person who says, and I download the CSV so I can make a pivot table, and we say, you know, you can probably call that because, and we'll, we'll help you. We'll show you how you meet that business process need, that data need for your business process in the new system, whether it's Tableau, Cognos, Oracle Financials, New Stream Information Systems, whatever it is, we'll show you how to do that because one of the goals here is for each, each inventory item to say, what's the path forward? How do you do the thing that you do in this current business process in this new world order? This, this box here, which you can't read, is governance. IT cannot come in and say, I still like these applications, but these ones are okay, yeah, we'll keep those. That's not our role to do. We can, we can provide technical expertise to say, this is why we think that this probably doesn't need to be around anymore, and this is why this does need to be need, does, is needed moving forward. But it's not our role to say that that list is okay. Governance comes in and says, looks at our list and, and kind of our, our, our assessment of impact and says, okay, we agree with this one, this one, this one, and this one. We don't agree with this one. So for example, if Steve Ross, I don't know if you, if you know who Steve Ross is. He's, he works for uh, Elizabeth. Uh, he's a uh, senior vice chancellor for resource administration and finance and stuff like that. Of course, has a dollar one, yeah, and so on. Anyway, money guy. So he likes to see business processes kind of uniform across the organization. And so if we come to him and we say, yeah, we decided we're going to keep this particular application because it supports this business process. Steve will come in and say, that's weird. I don't understand that why that department has to have a, best, a, a special business process that's different from the other 43 departments in academic affairs. Why is that? And if there's a good reason, they'll say, okay, yeah, we'll keep it. But his default assumption is 43 other departments can do this this way. This is the special snowflake department. Please justify me why you're a special snowflake. And he might say, you said keep, we're saying, don't, uh, we, we, we said keep it. And he's saying, no, nope, don't do it. Governance is going to say, no, nope, we're going to do it. And, then, and it could be the opposite way around. And then this is where application integration happens, where for those things that we do need to keep around, we're going to say, how do we integrate with this new world order? And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Progress today. Uh, we've developed the, uh, the comprehensive metadata specification to assess both the preliminary and data and detailed data consumer needs. I went through it briefly the, the, the preliminary ones. We have a lot more stuff that we collect for uh, applications uh, when we're trying to decide whether we're going to keep them or call them. All sorts of very technical stuff. Like, what operating system does it run on? What language is it in? What tables in the data warehouse does it talk to? Does it talk to it using this mechanism or that mechanism? Because we need to figure out what the damage is that ESR does, and if we need to remediate that damage, how do we do that? So we need this long list of technical details. Um, we have provisioned two data collection mechanisms. Some of you have maybe even added things to this. One is just a shared spreadsheet uh, where people can kind of type stuff in. Another is a for the lighter weight version is the web that collects the same information. Uh, a web-based form is a front end. Uh, it just deposits things in a spreadsheet, which then we kind of merge with the existing spreadsheet. Oh no, no, don't, don't, don't end the meeting. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I was wondering if that was you or is somebody else no, on the call? Is. 
end in the meeting. Um, okay, so uh, we've, we've had these two data collection mechanisms. mechanisms. We've collected preliminary information on about 1,500 business processes. Um, and I will guarantee you, and, and in some cases they have associated applications, I will guarantee you that that is the tip of the iceberg. There are all these other business processes out there that we need to worry about. However, we fully believe that we're not going to have the complete list of every single business process on campus. The goal here is to get maximum coverage to the extent that we can, uh, and recognize the fact that if this business process is identified in this department, this other department probably has something similar. So if we have this coverage case over here, we're probably going to be able to cover at least a, a maximal thing, maximal set of needs for this other department over here. Um, we're trying to get this out to as many people as possible. ESAs, application developers, uh, data analysts, uh, student affairs people, you name it, to get it to everybody so we can kind of understand the business processes. Elsewhere in ITS, uh, there's been the creation of a robust, robust integration service, which is essentially a mechanism that wires together uh, data exchange or data feeds between systems. That is the new way in which existing legacy systems will talk to existing legacy systems and new systems will talk to one another and exchange data. It's called iPaaS Integration Platform as a Service. I don't, um, I don't watch. Um, integration Platform as a Service. And it's essentially when we talk about remediation of these, these older legacy applications, this is what we're doing, is we're saying, you're going to have to read back to your code so that it talks to these new systems, right? And what it's going to talk to is this kind of common interchange. The advantage to that is now everybody's talking to the same common platform rather than the secret SQL query over here, the secret download over here, the secret pivot table over here, right? There is, the idea is kind of, again, consistency for business processes, consistency for data access. And questions? <laughs> <laughs> no questions. It was so clear that you know everything there is to know, right? I do have a specific question. Sure. So absolutely. I actually answered some of the questions about downstream data okay. inventory, and I don't know if I did it right. So when I pushed the data through the form, I just we'll find you if you did. Okay. No, no probably. <laughs> so I, I described the full budget process, and then in the comment section, added several URLs. Should I have done an individual form submission for each different application? It, it's a very good question. Um, it. it at this point, we're happy to get information. Uh, and if there's any ambiguity, we can dig into that. But, but what you, you bring up a very interesting point. One of, one, of, one of the things that I've seen is that you'll see clusters of applications that are clearly always, they're, they're actually all part of the same business process. It's like these steps are done by this application, then it passes information on to this other application, then we use that for this, and so on. So that actually helps us if you group those together, because part of the curation activity for us is to look at these 12 distant applications and say to ourselves, wait, there's actually all kind of going to the same business process. Because again, what we're interested in is the business process. Because if it, if it turns out that the overarching business process can be met by local financials or whatever, then those individual applications kind of essentially go away. You say, the business process is the thing that I care about. So when you start dividing up the business process in kind of weird, arbitrary ways, that actually makes it harder to try and figure out, right? Because then we're saying, okay, well, this does this, but then there's this other thing. Is that connected to this or not? And then they have to come back to you and say, these look like they're kind of related, but I'm not sure. Right? So bottom line, though, is the information you can provide is, is good, um, uh, particularly on financial stuff. We're trying to collect things on, oh, side, side note here. We're concentrating on financials because local financials is going to be coming online any moment now, uh, any year now. Um, <laughs> and uh, you see that too. Um, any, 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 any time now, and so that's why we're trying to concentrate on business processes associated with financials. But the reality is, what you see departments do is that they don't just say, "Give me a financial report." They'll say, "Give me a financial report and join it with the contracts and grants data, join it with this thing over here with the student support, and all this other stuff." So we're trying to collect it all because we need to understand those interrelationships now. Because when we get to the point of uh, specking out a student information system, we need to understand. It has it supports an interface with Oracle Financials so that they can do data collection. Right? So knowing about those kind of connections of those business processes is super critical for us. Uh, so so don't don't shirk on things that are not specifically related to Oracle Financials because end of the day, if you don't provide it to us, we'll come back to bug you later on. <laughs> uh, and there's going to be trust me, there's going to be a lot of bugging associated with this. Kind of Other questions.
Anybody? Anybody online? Anyone? No. Sure. Is there a time frame for the student information system, the inventory for that? Um, we are certainly collecting information. For, I mean, some of, some of the information we have now in the inventory, uh, in the formal inventory, does relate to student business processes. Um, we are not we're not forcing people to do that right now. Uh, we're trying to get as much information as we can. The timeline for that will probably be, I, I would say, later this year. Um, it's, it's still, you know, we haven't even thought about what the what the student information system is going to be. Uh, we we have we have done work on the requirements for it, but we haven't done any. Uh, we haven't narrowed it down to any vendors or anything like that. Uh, we need to understand kind of what the requirements are. So uh, again, the, the rule of thumb that applies is earlier is better, but We'll come back to you <laughs> if, 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 if we need the information. So probably in the, on the order of a year or so, I would guess, is when we would start to get up on that. We are now 36 seconds over. Um, any other questions before I release you to go do whatever it is you do for us? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, and by the way, the in the unlikely event that you actually want to go through this presentation again, uh, the URL here, the, it's going to be recorded or it has been recorded. And, and on the website, there's going to be uh, essentially all of the presentations for the workshops. So if you had to decide between this one and somebody else's workshop, you'll be able to see the other one. So, okay. Thank you.